When we last left China, it had been in a fragmented state after the fall of the Han dynasty in the early 200s, a period called the Three Kingdoms. During this early part of the medieval period, six different native Chinese dynasties ruled in the south, from around the fall of the empire, to 589. With the Han Empire collapsed, nomadic societies took advantage and invaded from the north, setting up their own dynasties. The Chinese middle class and intellectuals were profoundly affected by the collapse of the empire. Confucianism was supposed to keep society strong and maintain order. How could it have failed? More and more, Confucianism wasn't seen as pragmatic in this new world, so many would find solace in more esoteric or spiritual beliefs, like Taoism. Many intellectuals, like the Seven Sages of the Bamboo Grove, a group of scholars, writers, and musicians, preferred Taoism, while being at odds with the state Confucianism of the ruling class. Though Taoism was a spiritual philosophy, it still couldn't fulfill the majority of the population. Though there is an afterlife in Taoism, emphasis is placed on living your current life to the fullest. But this wasn't possible in this time of turmoil. People needed another belief system. And they got it, in the form of Buddhism. Buddhism came to China through missionaries and merchants, traveling the Silk Road. We had gone over the origins and spread of Buddhism in an earlier chapter. It had reached China by the time of the Han Empire's decline. A perfect time, as people were looking for something new. Buddhist ideals, especially of the Mahayana school, spread among all classes, as it complemented Taoism. It was at first criticized, as being foreign, but was over time added to Chinese culture. Monks like Farshian were instrumental in its spread. After almost 400 years of fragmentation, China was finally reunified in 581, under Yang Jian, founder of the Sui dynasty. He ascended to the throne on March 5, as Emperor Wen, ruling from his capital at Chang'an. As Confucianism was less popular, Emperor Wen promoted Taoism and Buddhism, erecting temples in the capital, and employing Buddhist monks in political positions. He also began the construction of a massive project. This was the building of a great canal, which linked the capital to the Yellow River. His son, Emperor Yang, completed the project, stretching the canal to the Yangtze in the south, uniting both of China's major rivers. This significantly increased the speed of crop shipments between both regions, giving the south more access to grains, and the north more access to rice. The canal was also used as a means of quick communication, and Emperor Yang used it as an imperial waterway, where he held elaborate processions to show off the splendor of the empire, and to keep watch over his people and his land. Like the Qin Empire, the Sui dynasty was more successful in unification, than at moral administration. The massive building projects were brutal for the conscripted manual laborers, and the high taxes left the emperor viewed in a negative light. Civil war broke out around 613, but the last straw was a failed invasion of Gugurio, an early Korean state which we will discuss next episode. Upon the emperor's return, he was assassinated by one of his advisors and another one of his generals took advantage of the turmoil and seized power. This was Li Yuan, and he would go on to found the next dynasty, the Tang. Unlike the short-lived Sui, which lasted for a mere 37 years, the Tang dynasty would survive for almost 300. Like the Han dynasty, this was also considered a golden age. Li Yuan took the name Emperor Gaozu, but only ruled until 626, when his son, Emperor Taizong took power. Under Taizong, China swelled in size and power. The western regions were pacified and given the name of Xinjiang, roughly meaning, New Frontier. The Chinese also extended their power into Tibet and the areas south of the Yangtze. China became without doubt the most powerful entity of East Asia. Commercial routes were formed to the southeastern states, while Chinese culture permeated into Korea and Japan. What made the Tang so successful was that it wasn't simply a strong military power. 
It invested in infrastructure, public works, and experienced a boom in arts and culture. Much of this was influenced by Buddhism. Monasteries became more common and the capital city of Chang'an was restored and even surpassed its former glory under the Han. It was a bustling cosmopolitan city of around 2 million, with marketplaces filled with items from all over the world. Palaces, temples, and monasteries filled the streets, giving the capital a splendor not seen in other cities of the time. Like the Han though, internal political machinations undermined the empire, leading to a weakening of the Tang. Around the midpoint of the empire, during the mid-700s, the empire was thriving under Emperor Xuanzong. Near the end of his 44-year reign though, he was embroiled in matters with his favorite concubine Yang Guifei, and politician Li Linfu. At their urging, the emperor appointed a foreign general to head a garrison in a large area north of the Yellow River. In 755, this general, Orn Lushan, instigated rebellion, capturing Luoyang in the east, and founding a new dynasty, the Yang. Chang'an also fell, but the rebellion was put down in 763. Though the Tang was restored, Emperor Xuanzong had died of natural causes, and the Tang was forever weakened. As the empire declined over the next 150 years, all signs pointed to a loss of the Mandate of Heaven. The Tang faced natural disasters, like floods, droughts, and earthquakes, and external threats from nomadic peoples like the Khitan. The Khitan emerged around the 300s, in Mongolia and the Russian Far East, having descended from proto-Mongolic tribes, and would go on to create an empire of their own in the north, called the Khitan Empire, or Great Liao, which would last for 200 years, and encompass a large territory. The more direct end to the empire though, came from within. Rebellions by military generals and warlords increased, and in 907, a regional military governor usurped the throne, ending the Tang, and leading to another period of fragmentation, known as the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms. This only lasted for a few decades, before a new dynasty took power in 960, the Song. It was founded by Emperor Taiju, who had overthrown the last of the five dynasties, and then went on to conquer the other kingdoms, unifying China again. The Song failed to reconquer the lands of the nomadic groups to the north though, and as pressure continued over the decades, the Song capital had to be moved south, to Linon, now Hangzhou, south of the Yangtze River. This was known as the Southern Song. Though they weren't noted for their military prowess, the Southern Song built a significant navy, and their rule became a period of economic and cultural prosperity. Back in the north, a new dynasty would overthrow the Khitan Empire, and drive them to the western regions. This was the Jin Dynasty, or Great Jin, a Jurchen state that formed in 1115, after a rebellion. The Jurchen would later be known as Manchu. In an attempt to reconquer their northern territories, the Song made an alliance with a new unified tribe of adept warriors from the inhospitable Gobi Desert and rugged steppe. These were, the Mongols. In 1234, the Mongols conquered the Jin, establishing themselves as rulers of northern China. But then, they turned their attention south, to the Song. Warfare broke out, which would last for decades. The new Great Khan of the Mongols, Kublai Khan, founded the Yuan dynasty in 1271, and in 1279, the Song made their last stand at the Battle of Yaman. The naval battle saw the Song outnumber the Mongol navy by 10 to 1, but they were still dealt a decisive defeat. The last Song emperor, Bing, who just turned 7, was watching the battle on a cliffside with his entourage, including statesman Lu Xiaofu. Once Lu saw that all was lost, he refused to be taken captive. He ordered his wife to commit suicide, and later wrapped young Emperor Bing in his arms and leapt off the cliff that had been their vantage point. And so ended the Song Dynasty, as the Yuan Dynasty claimed China. Politics during this time was driven by the Emperor, who sat at the top of the hierarchy. Under him, was the Grand Chancellor, who oversaw what was termed, the three departments and six ministries. The three departments were the Chancellery, Secretariat, and Department of State Affairs. 
Under this department, were the six ministries of personnel, revenue, rights, war, works, and justice. Officials for these ministries were chosen based on civil service examinations. It became the main route to a government job. There were three levels to examinations, with most people taking just the first one and working as a civil servant at the local level. Those who made it to the third level took their exam at the Imperial Palace and could claim positions in the Imperial bureaucracy. By the time of the Song, training academies were set up to help the poor in studying for these exams. Despite this, those who excelled the most at the examinations were the landed gentry. They were non-aristocratic landowners, many of who became an intellectual class called the literati, or scholar officials. With their rise to prominence through the examination system, they became the new elite class in China for centuries. Chinese regions were divided into subdivisions, starting with the area command, governed by an area commander. Below that was the prefecture, looked over by the prefect, and below that, the district, governed by a district magistrate. His job, along with his small retinue, was to maintain law and order, and collect taxes. Districts could hold as many as 100,000 people. Under the district is the village, but this was not part of the governmental system. Villages took care of themselves, appointed their own council of elders, and helped collect taxes to send to the district magistrate. The vast majority of Chinese people had no direct relationship with the government and simply relied on their own village councils. China's economy grew considerably during its golden age. Because of the constant barbarian incursions to the north, more of China's economic output moved further from the birthplace of Chinese civilization towards the Yangtze Delta, to the south. When the Song came to power, they attempted even stronger land reforms. Under Grand Chancellor Wang Anxi, there was increased currency circulation, the breaking up of monopolies, and early forms of governmental regulation and social welfare. The reforms succeeded, thanks to new developments, like improvements in the chain pump for irrigation, and the introduction of a new kind of rice from Southeast Asia, able to produce two crops annually. Gunpowder was also invented during this time, by mixing sulfur, saltpeter, and herbs. Use of the blast furnace to make steel also became widespread to inflation. International trade was conducted over land and sea since ancient times, but experienced a sharp decline after the fall of both the Han and Roman empires. The Tang expanded trade again over the Silk Road, and was successful, as much of the Middle East was unified under the Arab Caliphates, which sprang up in the 600s onwards. It was during the Tang, that the Silk Road reached its height, and along with it, the empire. The capital flourished, importing exotic products from the Arabian empires, like the Abbasids, and lands around the Indian Ocean. Trade was conducted by either the Turkic Uyghurs, or the Sogdians, an Iranian civilization from Central Asia. The Silk Road wasn't a single path or highway that linked the east to the west. It was a series of different routes that remained fluid. One of the first routes to be used were mountain passes full of jade crystals that flowed through Bactria. It was this route that the first Buddhist missionaries voyaged from India to China. After this, the best route would be to the north of the Tian Shan, or Heavenly Mountains, as climates were mild, and animals in the party could graze. The only problem were the rogues and bandits along the way. So traders preferred a more southern path, just along the fringes of the Taklamakan Desert. In the east, the end of the Silk Road was the Tang capital, Chang'an, most likely the richest city in the world at this time. Because of the natural disasters, nomadic invasions, and political struggles of the late Tang, Chang'an went into decline, along with the empire, and the Song never used it as the capital. During the Song, the Chinese also became more involved in sea trade. Indian Ocean trade had been dominated by those from the Indian subcontinent and the Middle East, but new technological innovations, like the compass and sternpost rudder, made the Chinese some of the foremost maritime traders in the world. 
Chinese ships traded the main exports of porcelain, silk, and tea, while importing cotton, stones, and exotic materials from the rest of Asia and beyond. A major port city developed, called Canton, home to over 100,000 merchants. An imperial commissioner was sent from the capital to regulate the trade here. The social structure of China also changed dramatically during the Chinese medieval period. Urban centers became more prominent and filled with artisans, merchants, and officials. In the countryside, instead of simply landed aristocracy and rural peasants, there were now also the landed gentry class and free farmers. The older aristocracy and elite classes declined as the civil service examinations attempted to level the playing field. Along with the devastating consequences of the Orn Lushan Rebellion, the aristocratic classes never recovered. The landed gentry ended up taking most of the official government positions, and replaced the aristocratic class as the political and economic elite. The upper classes in China were able to achieve a high standard of living, as China's golden age brought with it a cosmopolitan culture, through products and innovations from the Silk Road and maritime routes. A version of chess came in from India, along with foods the ancient Chinese could have never dreamed. Tea became part of the national culture, and was promoted by Buddhist monks as a way to focus the mind. The life of the average person though, was much less interesting. Most lived in small villages, and tended to their farms. Perhaps a short journey to another village for certain market products every now and then, but most lived a simple life. Families tended to be numerous, with three or more generations living together. Smaller family homes were made with dried mud or stone, and larger ones usually had courtyards. The head of the family was usually the oldest male, as in the ancient period. If his wife could not give him a son, he was allowed to take on a second wife. Wealthier men were able to have their wife, but also keep concubines in other rooms of the large house. If you recall the Confucian system from the ancient world, each family followed the concept of filial piety, which are moral norms, values, and respect for one's parents. Fathers could even choose their children's marriage partners. Women in general, were lower on the social hierarchy, because they were not as useful for intensive farm labor, and were not permitted to take the civil service examinations. Because of this, female babies were sometimes killed, or sold off to wealthier families. These girls often became concubines, domestic servants, or prostitutes when older. Though the Tang saw more women involved in politics, progress stopped under the Song, as they brought in a more strict view of Confucianism. Systems of dowry changed, from a man's family paying a woman's for the right of marriage, to the woman's family paying the man's family to take the bride. Many women were also subject to a very painful and debilitating practice. This was known as foot binding, and was a painful process involving breaking and then compressing a girl's foot until it is around half its size, using bandages. Feet that went through the process were called lotus feet, and these women had to wear special lotus shoes. Mothers would want their daughters to become bound, in order to get a better husband. A man would choose a footbound wife because it represents both discipline, as the process was long and painful, and submissiveness. It became common in northern China, but was less common in the fertile south, as women were more needed to help with cultivation. It was still practiced by the gentry class. In the urban centers, women were more prominent, where they were servers or owners of restaurants, textile outlets, and other small shops. Some would even take a liking to politics. In fact, the only recognized female of any dynasty to rule China was from this period. Her name was Wu Jiao, but would be known as Wu Zetian. She was a concubine to the Tang Emperor Tai Jung, and after his death, married his ninth son, Emperor Gao Jung, in 655. She remained the de facto ruler until 690, when she seized the throne directly and founded the Wu Zhou dynasty ruling as empress until 705, before she was finally deposed in a coup. 
Her 40-year rule helped cement the Tang dynasty as a golden period, and she remains the only female sovereign in Chinese history. With the demise of the Song in 1279, the Yuan, under the Mongols, became the next imperial dynasty of China. We went over the fall of the Song, but what about the rise of the Mongols? During the mid-1100s, the Mongols were groups of various clans living in what is now Mongolia. They weren't unified, but shared their practices of nomadism and pastoralism. By the turn of the century, populations were increasing, their pastures overgrazed, perhaps sped up by changing climate. The Mongol clans were in a state of distress, but a man came to save them and set them on a path to glory. His name was Temujin, son of Yasuke, chieftain of one of the Mongol clans. When Yasuke was killed, his family, including Temujin, was left abandoned in the cold wilderness. Once he grew older, he began to accrue more power. His goal now, to unite the Mongols and lead them, to greener pastures. When simple alliances failed, Temujin resorted to a more simple strategy. Temujin and his Mongol armies forcefully unified the clans, and he became sole ruler of the Mongols. In 1206, at a council of all the Mongol and Turkic chieftains, called the Kurultai, Temujin was named the great leader, the universal ruler, Genghis Khan. He ruled his people like a centralized state, by collecting taxes and mandating conscription in the army. Though his army reached 240,000 at one point, it was usually only between 120 and 150,000 soldiers. Their expert mobility and tactical movements often made their armies look triple the size. With the Mongol horde by his side, Genghis then expanded towards the east, towards the societies that occupied the north of China. First was the Western Shah, which was made a vassal by 1211. They were an empire founded 200 years earlier, by a possible Tibeto-Burman people, called the Tangut. Next, he attacked the Jurchens of the Jin dynasty and the Karakitai, those Khitans who had fled west from the Jurchen. The army then invaded the Khwarezmian Empire in Iran. During his conquests in the east, the Mongol army noticed the enemy wielding a special weapon that could shoot flames and projectiles. This was the Fire Lance, which developed from the Tang and Song dynasties. A glimpse of a future era dominated by gunpowder. A Mongol expedition was also sent to the northwest, to subdue Europe. Alas, we'll never know if such an invasion could have succeeded, as in 1227, Genghis Khan died during a siege of the Western Shah, which had rebelled. Under his successors, invasions would continue in Asia, and would succeed in sacking Baghdad in 1258, capital of the Abbasid Caliphate. We've gone over this in our video about the Arab empires. Genghis Khan's successors as Kagan, or Emperor, were Ogaday, Guyuk, Monk, and then Kublai Khan, who attempted a full conquest of China. In 1271, Kublai Khan established the Yuan dynasty, and by 1279, defeated the last of the Southern Song. And with that, Kublai Khan became the first non-native to rule over all of China. The Mongols were pastoralists, migrating with their herds annually, in search of pastures and water. They lived in portable, felt-covered tents, called yurts, and relied on the milk and meat from their herds. How could this group of nomads administer one of the most advanced civilizations on Earth? When Genghis still lived, the fierce Khan had stopped his people from becoming sedentary, or living in permanent cities. But after his death, his successors became more adapted to the ways of their conquered territories. You can win the battle from the backs of a horde of horses, but to administer is a different story entirely. Karakoram, which began as a village of yurts in the center of Mongolia, became the empire's capital. The Yuan dynasty was just one of four different khanates that emerged when the Mongol Empire became divided after the death of Monk Khan. The other three were the Golden Horde from the northwest, the Kipchaks and Cumans. The Shagatai Khanate operated in Central Asia, around the same areas as the former Karakitai. The Ilkhanate, which we've mentioned in our Arab Empire's video, was based in Iran and occupied territories in Western Asia and parts of Anatolia. Back in China, 
Kublai Khan established himself as ruler of China and moved the former Song capital from Kaifeng, further north, to Kanbalik. Today, this location is in Beijing. From China, the Yuan set their sights on further expansion. To the south was Vietnam, a region that had been previously controlled by China, but regained independence after the Tang Empire's decline. They also launched campaigns onto the islands of Java and Sumatra, in Southeast Asia, and to Japan in the east. All of these campaigns of conquest failed. Dai Viet and Champa, pushed back the invasion, only becoming tributaries, and off the coast of Japan, the Mongol fleets were devastated by divine winds, called Kamikaze, and the invasion failed. The Mongol armies didn't seem all that invincible after all. In China, the Mongols quickly realized they needed to learn how to administer a vast, and more crucially, sedentary state. The easiest way to do this was by using the previous Chinese dynasty's governmental structure. What was new, was that the Mongols considered themselves a separate class, and as such, were governed by separate laws. The Chinese living in the north were accustomed to foreign rule, and the southern regions maintained their economic prosperity as the Mongols kept the southern Song's economic policies. The empire brought stability along the Silk Road, and trade increased. The Grand Canal was also expanded, to head north from the Yellow River, to the capital. The capital grew to become a breathtaking city. The Italian merchant and explorer, Marco Polo, lived in the city for a while, while it was ruled by Kublai Khan. But over time, the Mongol way of life became a burden. Their failed expansionist campaigns, internal corruption, and low tax revenues led to financial ruin, and a prolonged decline. The final straw came in the 1340s, when a series of natural disasters led to a period of uprisings called the Red Turban Rebellions, beginning in 1351. By the late 1360s, the Yuan was defeated, and one of the leaders of the rebellion, Zhu Yuanzhong, founded the new Ming Dynasty, and with it, a new period of prosperity. Though the Yuan Dynasty didn't keep power for long, it was a miracle they kept control for as long as they did. Though it wasn't even a century, the impact of the Mongols was felt for much longer. The Mongol conquests brought a general stabilizing force to Eurasia, promoting easy communication and commerce along the Silk Road. This was known as the Pax Mongolica, similar to the relative peace brought by the Pax Romana, during the Classical period. Still, it is unwise to forget the atrocities that came alongside conquest. It is estimated 11% of the world's population was wiped out at the hands of the Mongol hordes, around 40 to 60 million. As they were laying waste to Eastern Europe, launching dead bodies over city walls, some of these could have been infected with a deadly disease. This was the bubonic plague, the Black Death that decimated 75 to 200 million, one third to one half of Europe's population. A prevalent theory is that diseased fleas living on black rats were spread from Genoese trading ships escaping the siege and reached ports all over the Mediterranean. Europe and parts of the Middle East were reeling, but in the East, the Ming led China out of the medieval period and into a modern age. Under this native dynasty, they expanded and reinforced their older fortifications to create a most awesome wonder of the world. This was the Great Wall of China. During the early Ming, the emperor continued to rule through state Confucianism, and kept the institutions from the previous golden eras. Modified agrarian policies from the Han, governmental structure from the Tang, and the new manufacturing workshops from the Song. The Yongle Emperor, the third ruler of the Ming, reigned from 1402 to 1424. He moved the imperial capital from Nanjing in the south, to Beijing in the north, commissioning the construction of his palace complex, the Forbidden City. Just three years into his reign, he commissioned a voyage through the Strait of Malacca, and into the Indian Ocean. This was a treasure fleet, led by the eunuch Zheng He. These treasure ships were reportedly enormous, thought to hold hundreds of sailors on each floor, this voyage was made up of 62 of these ships, with a total of almost 28,000 men. 
Along with these ships, were a number of other companion vessels. Though China had always been a participant on the Silk Road, they were opening themselves to become the main participants in the Indian Ocean trade as well. Later expeditions reached as far as Arabia and the eastern coast of Africa. The purpose of the voyages can only be speculated, but it was most certainly done as a means of showcasing Chinese power for economic gain. The ships were heavily militarized and would bring back foreign ambassadors who would declare their states as tributaries. Another purpose was the emperor's curiosity for foreign products. After the fifth voyage, ambassadors brought in exotic animals like ostriches, zebras, and giraffes to the Ming court, a most magnificent scene in the east. While the voyages brought untold profits to Zheng He's associates, this didn't go over well with the other conservative elites, as the central state seemed to take control over what had previously been a maritime economy run by private interests. Some suggested the government go back to internal affairs and focus on domestic policy. Under Yongle Emperor's successors, Hongzhi Emperor and Xuander Emperor, the expeditions were slowed down and suspended. Emphasis again moved from the international trade-filled maritime south, towards the north, around the Yellow River, the birthplace of Chinese civilization. Though Nanjing remained a southern capital, the imperial capital was to stay in Beijing almost consistently for centuries. A stone's throw from the Great Wall, the emperor was able to keep watch on China's most dangerous border. China would then turn inwards and remain in isolation for hundreds of years, leaving the keys of the incoming age of discovery to the west. By the time the Sui reunified China, Confucianism had to compete with both Buddhism and Taoism. We had discussed earlier that these more esoteric belief systems became popular during times of upheaval, during times when it was believed Confucianism failed the natural order. Christianity had also been introduced around this time by merchants from Syria, and Chang'an was even home to a church by the 500s. From the time Buddhism was introduced, it began to take a different shape than it had in India and Southeast Asia. It became Sinicized, becoming influenced by Chinese culture and Taoist beliefs, and split into a number of different branches. One of these was called Chan Buddhism, a school of Mahayana, and stress training the mind through meditation, as a path to enlightenment. In Japan, this was called Zen Buddhism. It became popular with intellectuals and ascetics. For the more common folk, Pulan Buddhism became popular. Instead of strict regimens, it was based only on devotion, and instead of enlightenment, the goal was to be reborn in a pure land, or Buddha field, a celestial realm where one can meet a Buddha and train their spirit for eventual enlightenment. A more political sect of Pulan Buddhism branched off, called the White Lotus. They became a sort of secret society, responsible for uprisings and rebellions throughout Chinese history, and were instrumental in the Red Turban rebellions against the Yuan Empire. More esoteric and mystical branches of Buddhism flourished as well, like Tantrism. This path to enlightenment had more to do with mandalas, ritual poses, and yogic influences from India and Tibet. Because of Buddhism's popularity, it threatened Taoism and Confucianism, two of China's native ideologies. Buddhism was seen as foreign, but above all, corrupted. During the Tang period, as the aristocratic classes were losing power, Buddhist monasteries were amassing large amounts of wealth, and were tax-exempt. Resentment among the elite grew, and eventually there were periods of Buddhist persecution by the state. At its heart, Buddhism's teachings went against the Confucian system that had been in place and maintained order. A rigid structure of social hierarchies, filial piety, and work ethic, was undermined by the more intangible values of the Buddhist schools. While the state had supported the faith at different periods, it was to take a backseat to Confucianism. Confucianism was reinvigorated, and it brought back the emperor's legitimacy as the intermediary between heaven and earth like in the ancient period. But it came back in a different form. During the Tang, Confucian scholars began to add metaphysical elements into their ideology. 
By the Song period, this belief system became known as Neo-Confucianism. This turned Confucianism more into a philosophy than a set of guidelines. It adopted metaphysical elements from Taoism and Buddhism, but still stressed a pragmatic participation in society, not monastic living. Zhu Xi integrated the Taoist concept of the Tao, or Wei, and the metaphysical aspects of Buddhism, with Confucianism, to create this new syncretic philosophy, adapted from earlier Tang scholars Han Yu and Liao. The ideology became so prominent that Neo-Confucianism would supplant its older version in government, and became the core of questions in the civil service examinations. But during the mid-Ming period, in the late medieval, Wang Yangming, a politician and philosopher, began to criticize Zhu Xi's teaching. He instead believed that knowledge came from within, and that one must rely on one's own intuition and insight to gain understanding and achieve moral perfection. This was called the school of the mind, as its basis was that the mind and universe are linked. Despite garnering many followers, the school of the mind never achieved official status because of its lack of emphasis on participation in family and governmental life. During China's medieval period, culture reached its highest point. It was a time of technological advancement and artistic achievement. While paper had been created during the Han, woodblock printing occurred during the Tang. It emerged in the 600s by engraving text into a block of wood. This wood was then inked and pressed onto paper. These papers were usually quite long and then folded together to form a sort of book. According to the British Library, the earliest printed book from here that we know of is a Buddhist text from 868, called the Diamond Sutra. Printed on it is a disclaimer that the book is for free and public distribution, making this not only the first printed book, but the first book explicitly in the public domain. Printing was meant to make the transmission of books cheaper, but they still remained too expensive for a lot of the population. After the Han, dynasties would write their own official dynastic histories of their predecessors, and encyclopedias became more prominent as a source of quick and easy information. Beyond history and information, this period was the height of Chinese literature, especially poetry. These poems were generally about the natural world, its beauty, and humankind's place in it all, through the laughter and sadness that attaches itself to everyone's life. Interestingly enough, the concept of romantic love seems not to have been as important as it was in Western or South Asian sources. Because of the nature of Chinese characters, poems tended to be quite short. With this brevity came mysteriousness. Li Bai is a famous poet from the Tang period, flourishing during the golden age of Chinese poetry. He was a Taoist and is known for his short poems about his life, the places he had visited, his friends, and carefree descriptions of nature. Some of his most well-known poems are Drinking Alone by the Moonlight and Waking from Drunkenness on a Spring Day. His younger friend, Du Fu, was a Confucian scholar official and was more grounded in his writings. His poems dealt with history and ethics. In the West, he came to be compared to Virgil or Shakespeare. The Onlushan Rebellion began while both Li Bai and Du Fu lived, but when the unrest ended, only Du Fu remained. Du Fu was the first diabetic mentioned in Chinese records and perished later in 770. Nightlife during the Song was quite exciting. While the Tang has often issued curfews, the Song allowed entertainment throughout the night. Musicians would play, wrestlers and acrobats would perform shows, and shadow plays and storytelling would excite the crowds. Perhaps the most influential novel to come out of China was written during the Yuan period. The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, first printed in 1321, tells the story, part historical, part romanticized fiction, of the fall of the Han and the aftermath during the period of the Three Kingdoms. It follows hundreds of characters, including peasants and feudal lords, until the year 280, when China was temporarily reunified during the Six Dynasties period. 
The novel is one of the four Chinese classics, along with Water Margin, Journey to the West, and The Plum in the Golden Vase. More visual art styles also flourished. Though beautiful and sophisticated painting styles were widespread during the Han period, these were mainly tomb paintings, and there are only a few examples. By the time of the Song and Yuan, paintings were more common and reached even higher levels of complexity. Like both philosophy and literature, Chinese art was inspired by Buddhism and Taoist elements, an example of this being the famous caves in western China near the Dunhuang Oasis. The caves contained stunning displays of Buddhist art, spanning 1,000 years of China's medieval period. They were first dug out in 366, as a palace for Buddhists to stop and meditate, and merchants who wished to rest and pray for safe travel. Once Islam came to dominate Central Asia by the time of the Yuan, the Silk Road went into decline, and by the time of the early Ming, it declined in favor of maritime routes. The caves and oasis became depopulated, and slowly abandoned. As Taoism was more ingrained in Chinese society though, it became an even greater influence in Chinese art. Chinese artists would often travel to the mountainside or forests in search of the Tao, either writing poetry or painting the majestic scenes they witnessed and became part of. Shan Shui is a traditional style of Chinese painting and means mountain water, symbolizing the hard and the soft, the balance which is found in nature, the yin and yang. Many Chinese painters were also writers, so these paintings frequently also have a small poem included. Chinese paintings often seem inherently different to contemporary Western ones, because of their focus on balance. Humans in nature are not the main focus, and are seen as small and even insignificant. They are a part of nature, not a master of it. Chinese paintings were often displayed on silk or a paper scroll. They could be up to 20 feet, or 6 meters long. To fully appreciate the art piece, you would start at the bottom, watching either a small village or a serene lake, and then scroll upwards to view the low hills, then majestic mountains, and heavenly skies. During the late Tang and early Song, paintings began to lose color, as artists preferred the contrast of black ink on white silk or paper. This style conveyed the art of calligraphy and brush strokes better. Some literati artists, adept at a multitude of different art styles, painted in a more secular fashion. Their paintings had no deeper meaning, no attempts to convey the Tao, just mere artistic expression. Another notable area of art, was porcelain. Porcelain was created in a kiln, baked from a clay mineral. These ceramics became popular during the Tang period, and flourished during the Song. Some of the most famous ceramics are Celadon pottery, notably from the Longxuan kiln. These were glazed with a jade color, and have also been called greenware. The most famous Chinese pottery by far though, is the blue and white pottery, often associated with Ming vases. This style actually originated during the Yuan. The pottery was decorated underneath the glaze with a blue pigment, often cobalt oxide, as it was able to withstand the high temperatures while baking. The style was imitated by Islamic cultures, Japan, and Europe, like this Delftware. The Ming's artistry would continue with the dynasty, into the early modern world.